see if I can. Do we have a share screen? It is not showing that I have the ability to share a screen right now. It says multiple participants can share simultaneously. Is it at the bottom of the screen? Oh, there we go. Yep. There we go. All right. So let me There we go. So first off, I just want to thank you all so very much for inviting me to speak with you all on this subject. Um, macro is one of the subjects that I shoot a lot of. Um, my primary focus is wildlife followed by abstract impressionistic um, abstract impressionistic work as well as macro photography and then uh, scapes, both seascapes and landscapes. So um, pretty much if you were to put me in one category, it would be just nature photographer. Um, so hopefully this presentation will give everybody and um, a little bit of something to start with uh, and work with macro, whether it's the first time you've ever shot macro or if you've been doing this for a while. This is going to showcase how I shoot my macro. Um, I don't do things like uh, focus stacking. Um, we get into a little bit of creative work it, within this presentation, but really this is kind of just the straightforward um, magic of macro uh, and, and focusing on small things in life. Um, because I think nature's details, the things that we're walking by every day, can present us some really beautiful photographic opportunities if we take the time to slow down and capture them. So I want to show you how to do that. So just as an introduction, um, macro photography is photography where the subject is smaller in life than in the image or it's a one-to-one. -one. So a lot of times you'll see macro lenses labeled as a one-to-one -one ratio, which means that when you photograph an image, um, a subject that you're photographing it at life size. Um, so it's the same size in the camera that it is in uh, in life, basically. So um, it highlights the beauty of the small things, small details um, within nature, and it can be done both indoor, outdoor, man-made, or nature. Uh, it's all up to you as to how you use these techniques. Um, I have their hashtag slow, <laughs> slow photography movement, and that's because um, uh, that hashtag is used a lot by a group of photographers who are trying to get more people to really slow down and look around them for the various opportunities. And macro fits right into that because you really do kind of have to slow down. Um, you know, you're not rushing to a particular spot because you know that there's one flower there and it's going to have a bug on it. Like that's not, that's not how this works. Um, <laughs> so it's, you have to go out and just kind of slow down and see what opportunities come to you. Um, so what to look for. So we're going to go into kind of the various subjects to focus on if you don't already have an idea of what you want to focus on. You know, if you don't have a garden in your backyard with a ton of flowers, you know, where do you start looking for macro subjects? So Brian Peterson, he is kind of the, the color master when it comes to photography. He's written books on color um, and He's phenomenal. If you haven't heard of him, I highly suggest uh, looking him up. I took one of his classes and he said something that really kind of struck with, stuck with me, and that is shoot the adjective. What is it that draws you to your subject? Um, you know, whether it's the moose, whether it's the flower, whether it's the bug, what is it that is drawing you to the subject? Um, is it the color? Is it the pattern, the textures, the, the, the bug that's on the mushroom? Um, what is it that draws you to that scene and then shoot that adjective? Don't just shoot the flower, shoot the colors of the flower, shoot the textures of the bark, that sort of um, thing. So 
be asking yourself those when you're out in the field. So color is a big draw within macro and in photography in general. Um, it's what usually will attract us to a subject first and foremost. Um, it's why flowers are colored the way they are, is to attract pollinators. Um, so with colors, you get analogous colors and complementary colors. Those are going to be the two um, color matches, if you will, on the color wheel that are most easily found and are most visually attractive. So in this here, we have complementary colors, the green, the blue, the yellows. Um, they are across from each other on the color wheel. You also have color tones. So it's all one color, but the tones and the shades change within the landscape. So here we have, um, this is a peony and you can see it's all this beautiful shade, but then it's the tones within the image that bring out those details. And it was really that tone that attracted me to the image between the tones and the fine lines. So it gives it kind of a very abstract, very soft color um, and makes this image work. With patterns, um, I do a lot with black and white to bring out patterns. So in post-processing, I will turn it um, black and white and simply because it's the pattern that attracted me to this so it's not necessarily the colors. So the colors can add a distraction if I want my viewer to really focus on the patterns. So by turning it black and white, it really brings out these dew drops that were caught in a spider web or the reflection of the flower. Here we also have patterns and these are shot using a very uh, small aperture, sorry. Uh, it would be a, a wide aperture, a small number. Uh, um, and so this is probably going to be about a 2.8, maybe a F4, somewhere in there. Um, but to really kind of focus on the pattern that these individual types of spines from three different cactus give. So you have an element of color here, but you also have the patterns and the variance within the pattern. Or here, this is done in inside. Um, this was an early COVID project where I was just working with a bowl of water and soap and oil and so this was with just the soap and these are little soap bubbles and I put colored paper underneath the bowl and lit the colored paper and so you get this pattern coming through that you're able to capture at a macro level that just makes for a very interesting and intriguing image. You can also look for the details. So is it the, the piston and stamen of a flower or this top image here, that's the tongue in an orchid. So the little tongue that sticks out of the orchid flower, capturing that small detail of the flower. Here we have a dew drop on a leaf. This is a lupine and the dew drop after um, morning fog rolled through left the dew drop there, capturing that small detail. So, or here, a variety of different flower details. So you don't have to capture the entire flower, but it's just the detail. What draws you to it? Here we have a flower opening and you have all these beautiful little hairs, but you have that opening with that color popping out or you have the layers of flowers, this lower one, and of course the, the middle of the flower and all that beautiful detail with the pollen. Did you say what lens you use for your macro? So the lens I use for macro is the Tamron 90 millimeter macro lens. And I have used, so 
with these images here, these were taken with the Nikon 105 macro, oh. the, the older version. Um, nowadays, though, I'm strictly the Tamron 90. It's a more up-to-date and sharper lens. Thank you. So here, so this was inside, um, again, under, you know, artificial light, and we'll talk about light here in a moment, but, you know, capturing the detail of the, the droplets here on this succulent. And then looking for small life. Um, you know, the birds, the butterflies, um, bees, dragonflies. And this takes a lot of patience to get macro. So you have to have some pretty cooperative subjects, but it can make for some absolutely beautiful images if you use that macro to capture the small bits of life. And it doesn't have to be just close-ups, just portraits. You can have them here where you have this beetle going into the flower or the ants coming in and out of the flower. Or even doing some portrait work with lizards. So setting up the scene. Um, there are two types of scenes. I, I kind of categorize them as two types of scenes. You have your natural scene where it's just a scene that you find and you photograph it the way you find it. Um, and then you have your curated, which is gonna be either your indoor setup or if you have an outdoor area, you know, a garden and you're able to really kind of manicure it and move things about, get them just the way you want. That's more of a curated scene. And there's nothing wrong with either one. It's just there, there's two types of scenes that you wanna be looking for. So a curated scene, this is where us, this is one of a series I did during COVID of dandelion dancers and using dandelion seeds I had picked up while walking my dogs and bringing them back into my house and setting up something on my kitchen table so that I could photograph these dandelion seeds, imagining that they are dancers performing on a stage. Um, Whereas the natural one, I had to warn my neighbors that I might be out and about in the neighborhood um, because they might come out in the morning to get their morning newspaper and find me lying on the sidewalk and no, I was okay. Don't call the ambulance, please. But, um, you know, the morning dew on the grass, I captured this image by laying down on the sidewalk and I just happened to be out for a morning walk because with my camera, that's what I was doing. Um, and I was able to find this tiny dewdrop that looked like it was just about to roll off this blade of grass. Um, and then to, you know, kind of add the, the cherry on the top, I had an additional dewdrop in the back that got blurred out and created this other orb in the background. Um, and that was just, that was luck. Uh, I'll honestly put that there. That was luck. Um, but I absolutely loved how this drop, it just, it looks like it's just about to go. And yet it was there for many, many minutes while I was waiting and I walked away before it ever fell. It was very secure right there on the blade of grass. So here, this is a technique that I use a lot because I really like with the macro, making it very soft and very airy um, because not, you know, when you're shooting close to the ground in the grass or in a bush, you know, it's a, there's a lot of crunchy textures and I like to highlight our, my subjects by just making it very soft, very creamy. And so one way I do that while I can get my background like that, if I'm just shooting directly on a subject, it doesn't really give a additional foreground element to make soft. So I create a foreground sheet kind of element by shooting through foliage or flowers that might be surrounding my subject. So it means that I'm backing up a little bit and I'm finding a way to shoot through other branches or blades of grass in order to soften my foreground because of those items being right in front of my lens. So I'm shooting through those 
but my I do a selective focus point right on my subject. So whether it's like in these instances, my subjects are the flower, but I'm shooting through foliage in front and then the foliage behind them also blurs out. So it creates this very soft and airy texture around my subject. So talking a bit about light, um, so open shade is probably to me the best light you can shoot in for natural macro. And this was taken midday, bright sunny day, but what I did was I placed myself directly over this poppy in order to cast my shadow onto it. And then I was able to shoot directly down into the flower. <sighs> Overcast and rainy days, obviously those are really great, especially if you're wanting to work with dew drops, with raindrops coming down. Uh, also with the overcast, the clouds create a natural diffuser, so you don't have really hot highlights when it comes to lighting. But just if, if you have bright sun, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and do macro either. You just have to be careful of your highlights, such, you know, both in a traditional sense, but also in the color gamuts, because macro is done a lot with colors, um, with your reds, your yellows, your oranges and flowers, those particular color channels can blow out easily as well. And they don't necessarily show up on your histogram unless you actually are showing all your color histograms. Um, so it's something to be aware of if you're shooting in bright sun. And then we have controlled or directed light. So this would be more like your setup in the studio. Um, or when I talk about directed light, I'm talking about, okay, you have some tulips in a pot in your window and you're able to turn the pot so you're directing the light as it comes through in a way that you want to present in your image. So let me go back here real quick. So that's what these two first two images are. They're directed light on tulips that I had sitting in a window. And then this third one, the bubbles, that's oil and water, much like I described in the earlier image. And so my directed light is actually a flashlight being used from underneath the bowl. So I'm able to control all the light in these images. And then looking even deeper within your macro scenes and looking for things like reflected images within your dewdrops. So here we had a tulip. I had the dewdrop on the tulip and then it's reflecting a tulip that was behind it. Um, or in the image on the right, that's just my kitchen reflected um, since I was playing with this in my kitchen at, at one time. But it's those sort of things that you want to look for. Now notice that um, on the tulip, both images, the scene that's reflected is upside down. So that's why a lot of times when you're seeing reflected images in dewdrops, it pays to use circular flowers or a circular subject in the background because then people don't know which way is up or down. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind if you're going to be curating a scene where you want to photograph um, the reflected images in dewdrops is kind of go for more of those round or abstract subjects than you would actually have. And then cleaning the scene up if possible. So even when I'm out in nature, especially when I'm working with larger flowers like big Gerber daisies or dahlias, I normally will have a paintbrush or like a makeup brush with me because if there's a few little grains of sand or dirt on those flower petals, I want to be able to brush that off because I don't like spending a lot of time in post-processing. So instead of having to clone those out in post, if I brush them off gently beforehand, I'm able to just clean up the scene that way. Um, in this case, I had to spend a lot of time in post-processing to clean up all these little bubbles, air bubbles that were surrounding my actual subject. 
So if I'd had a bit more patience, I could have just let those bubbles settle out, which is if you're going to be working with oil and water, I highly suggest setting it up in the morning to shoot in the afternoon so that all the little bubbles that form can kind of settle out, come to the top and collect. So gear. Um, like I said earlier, so my main lens that I shoot with is the Tamron 90 millimeter macro. It's a one-to-one -one f2.8, absolutely phenomenal um, macro lens, sharp, fast, and, and quiet. Um, telephoto lenses can be used for close-ups, so that open shade California poppy that I showed, that was actually a close-up. It wasn't a true macro because that was taken with the Tamron 18 to 400 lens, which has a very close focusing range. So it can be used for macro-like images, um, but because it's not a true macro lens, it's considered a close-up. Um, and then cell phone users, if you have any cell phone users, I like to throw this out there is that they do, you have options for clip on lenses um, uh, or the possibility of using a loop or other magnifying accessory if you're just using a cell phone. And then a uh, tripod is very handy, even though for me, I shoot most of my work, probably 90, 95% of my work is handheld, regardless of the genre. Um, other than long exposures and a few of the, the macro. If I'm working macro in low light where it is not moving, I will put it on a tripod. And then supplemental lighting off camera. I don't use this if I'm out in the field. I only use this if I'm working indoors. So, um, but that's completely up to you. I do know people who will carry a small flash with them for off camera flash to use when lighting a subject when they're on a trail or others have the ring lighting around their lens. So there's a lot of options for you there. So settings. Depth of field, to me, this is top priority. Again, because I like the very light and airy look of macro, of, of my, it's my style of macro photography, my depth of field is my top priority. Um, and so here we have an F 5.3 is what it is actually, the lens was at a 2.8. So it, it's a bit weird when working with the Tamron 90 millimeter macro and a Nikon because Nikon's kind of made its cameras extra smart, I guess, um, because what it does is based on the distance to the subject and the light coming in, it gives you what the um, actual, if you are on a 35 millimeter camera, what the actual aperture reading would be. Um, so a lot of times when I'm at 2.8, my camera says f 2.3. So the lens was at 2.8 for this particular image. Um, even though the camera read 5.3. It's a little bit confusing, so I apologize. But you can see how very shallow the depth of field is. Only the very tips of these first few petals are actually sharp, and then it just absolutely drops off. Whereas an F11, you have this entire bunch of flowers, and the majority of the flowers are sharp but you can see it starts dropping off by the time it reaches the middle of the bunch and it hits the stem that's going through them. So even at F11, it's still a very shallow depth of field when using a macro lens. Your aperture, your depth of field, the slivers um, that you get from it are much smaller than you would with some of the other lenses. And then as I mentioned before, also, I use a single point of focus. So in these images, I would have focused directly on the little white flower. And that allows me to shoot through vegetation and blur the vegetation that's in front of my lens and focus directly on that flower that's a little bit further away. Or here, I wanted to focus in a bit to give more bring my subject and bring the viewer's eye into the frame, 
I didn't want the flowers right on the edge to be sharp. So I wanted to focus slightly into the frame using that shallow depth of field. So I was able to make that particular flower sharp and the rest kind of drift off. So here we have, I focused on the dew drop itself. And so the sharpest point is actually the reflections in the dew drop. And then everything drops off. Or here, the very tip of the petal drops up and then everything else drops off. Using as low of an ISO as possible is preferable, much like any other landscape photography. Um, you want to use as low of a, an ISO as possible. However, I am well known for starting at ISO 800 and hand holding. So it just depends on your style of shooting. If you're always working on a tripod, you can normally easily go much lower than, than 800. Um, if you're hand holding and it's lower light, you might need um, a higher ISO. And then when it comes to shutter speed, things you want to consider with shutter speed. So you have your aperture. And for me, I like to shoot wide open. So I have a shallow depth of field. So you have your shallow depth of field, you set your ISO up, your shutter speed is going to be where you can control kind of if your subject's moving or not and how, how that works. So a lower shutter speed in a controlled environment or on a tripod is great. Um, if your subject's not moving and you want to have that low ISO and you have, um, the tripod, go ahead, have a very low shutter speed, you know, have a half second even. Um, if it's not going anywhere, it doesn't matter. However, if you're working with something like small life, such as an ant, it's not necessarily going to hold still for you. So you want to make sure that you have a shutter speed that's going to capture that movement and freeze it. And so you want to make sure that you're working with a higher shutter speed, even if that means bringing your ISO up when working either handheld or with moving subjects such as insects. I caveat that with play with your shutter speed because in this image of a tulip, this was using a slow shutter speed and intentional camera movement. So I had relatively lower light. It was just window light coming in on the tulip and I really love the colors. And so that's what I was trying to capture. And so I did a bit of, it's very subtle, but I moved the camera just slightly, just enough to kind of blur it. It tells you that it's a tulip or at least a flower, but it doesn't actually have any of the other details other than the colors. So play with your shutter speed. Post-processing tips. So, um, I utilize Lightroom exclusively. And then um, for people who are using cell phones, I highly suggest Snapseed. So I keep my post-processing very simple. Um, I shoot in raw. It's easier um, and less destructive in the editing process. I use very minimal processing to focus on the subject. So in this image of these plum blossoms, um, I just made my typical adjustments for contrast and exposure. And then I used radial filters in conjunction with the clarity slider to make sure that my background was uniformly very soft, very blurred, and made sure that it was just the way I wanted it. Um, and then I also increased the exposure, especially if I'm having to shoot underexposed due to the shutter speed I'm using. Um, or having a slower lens. So if you do have a lens, if you're doing maybe close-up photography and you only have a lens that goes to f4, um, then, and then go ahead and increase your exposure if you want to have a light, bright, and airy image um, and maybe you were shooting on an overcast day. So I, t I typically will increase my exposure to do that. But it's really simple. If I have to work on an image more than maybe five, max 10 minutes, then I do not, normally I pass on that image. So I'm not doing a lot to these images. So with all of that being said, 
I would like to open it up to any questions, um, comments, or and even questions outside of macro if you'd like. But I'd like to start with the macro specific um, questions, anything that you might have. This is Tina. I just want to say that your images are stunning. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. And I guess um, I wish I it what the presentation was last night because I did get an opportunity. It rained a little bit today when I went to the um, bridge, and it would have been perfect to try and get some of the little raindrops. And I was going to say when you said that you had gone out and it started raining when you opened your door, I was like, oh, I hope she took advantage. <laughs> did not. Oh, <laughs> but maybe, well, maybe next time. So. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you'll have other chances. Hey, look, this will give you another excuse to get out of the house, right? That's true. So I'll look forward to that. Does anybody have any um, questions? I don't, I don't have a question, but I just want to say I really enjoyed the presentation. And I think <laughs> the, the first comment about shooting the adjective kind yes. of rings home with me because I get so knotted up trying to shoot detail and me too. I forget about the color and the shapes. So I think that was right on. I appreciate that tip. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we get so many times, especially when we're first starting out and, you know, even as our, our, photography careers progress, you know, whether we're hobbyists or not, but as we progress in this field, I feel a lot of times we really can get caught up in the technical and we forget this is an art and we're supposed to be doing and capturing what we're seeing and not worrying so much about, oh, is it this f-stop? Is it this, this, you know, is it the right depth of field? Is it the right shutter speed? Like, what am I trying to do here? And what do I want my viewers to take away from the image? So I, I that really helped hit home when he told, when he said that, and, and I like to pass that on because that one was really, yeah, so, but thank you. And if you look at his Im images, I mean, his colors are amazing. I mean, even he is the master of color. Well, he's my favorite. So um, <laughs> I love him. Um, so um, I wish, I mean, I hope to take a class from him one day, but um, it's amazing. So, anybody else have any comments or questions that you'd like to ask Elise? Is your monthly newsletter uh, come on email? Yes, yes, it does. Okay. And we'll post that on our website as well so um, folks can sign up for that. Um, we do appreciate you joining us um, tonight and um, going over the macro. And I know you have several other subjects, so we would like to welcome you back at another time as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I I'll get with you on that um, as well. So. Um, so if anybody doesn't have any extra questions uh, or any additional questions, does somebody I, have a question? I, yes, I was looking at all your images. I enjoy that type and I find all your images very pretty. I'm pretty, I guess. Anyway, maybe that's not the right word, but. I'll take it. I'll, also, I love hearing that they're pretty, so. <laughs> I also enjoy the close up images like you take. And I have started at once in a while anyway, using the Lens Baby Velvet series. The yes. 56. Have you ever used that? It seems to me many of your images almost have that look. It's a little different, but if, do you, I know I, you're a Tamron rep sort of, or whatever it is. So are you even allowed to, have you ever used them? Do you enjoy them? You know, what is your take on those? I have not used them. And I will honestly say I've been using Tamron for near on 10 years. Um, and I only became an ambassador this past spring um, for them. 
Um, I love their lenses, even if I wasn't one of their ambassadors. Oh, yeah. I have not shot with the Lens Baby Velvets. However, Anne Belmont does amazing, amazing floral work, um, macro work with the Lens Babies. Um, and I love her stuff. Um, and I like that style. Um, I just don't shoot with those lenses so I found kind of a similar you know a similar style that I enjoy doing um but okay. I've heard wonderful things about those lenses I've, I've had fun and what do you consider a dis the distance between close up and macro I know you can get real close and but at what point is do you change the term does that make sense so if, from my understanding, basically the term is changed when you're using a dedicated macro lens mm -hmm. or um, macro type like extension tubes, those right. that are specific for macro, right. whereas close-ups are going to be like those that you take with a longer lens, either a telephoto or if you have, you know, a 35 millimeter that gets close, that has the focusing distance close, but it's not technically a macro, then it's considered a close up. For most people, like, <laughs> I was going to say, for most people, when they see that California poppy that I took, mm -hmm. like, they automatically think it's a macro. I have to define it as a close up because I know what lens I took it with. Um, so, it's really up to you in, in all honesty. Um, now, if you have, you know, one flower and it's like, you know, it's kind of obvious that you took it with a 50 millimeter and you've got a lot of border around it, then maybe that's not a macro, uh, right. a, a macro. Yeah. Um, but when it gets down to that nitty gritty, if you have a lens that has a very small focal distance and you're able to get in and get those details, who cares? Unless, yeah, unless you're entering a contest or, or entering some sort of, uh, you know, putting together an article or something and you're talking about macro lenses and maybe just use images that you've actually taken with macro. Lenses. But otherwise, we're, again, we're in it for the art. These are tools. The lenses are tools. Um, really, it's a matter of the final product. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And if no one else has anything, I've got one more question. <laughs> Earlier, you said something about uh, you shot with a Nikon, is that correct? Yes, yeah. Okay, well, I do also. But anyway, and you had the F, the aperture set at 5.3, and you said something, but it was really at 2.8. I misunderstood, well, all of that, I guess you could say. Uh, can you just... Can you kind of tell me what you're, what, what you said? So I think the easiest way to understand it is when we say a lens is say a, a 105, but we're putting it on a crop sensor, it's actually right. the, the actual outcome Watch that it. image is actually yeah. a longer than what it would be if it was 35. Basically, this is doing something very similar with the aperture. So the lens is saying it's a 2.8, but then Nikon's going, it's not really a 2.8, it's a 5.3 because of the factors that factor into it. And I'm not super technical on it. I've just gotten asked about that because Canon cameras don't do that with this lens. Um, they'll tell you 2.8. It's only the Nikon lenses that for some reason are doing this disconnect um, and, and putting it out there. So um, yeah, so that, that's probably the easiest way to understand it is it's just like, it, it's giving you the reading that it would uh, for the output um, mm -hmm. versus what the actual lens is reading at the 2.8. At least. Can, yes. Uh, this is Lloyd. Uh, uh, back in the old old days, when I was a puppy, and you were shooting with view cameras, uh, you have a thing called Bellis draw, and at one to one, you lose two f stops. So the actual aperture of that two eight lens 
at one to one would be f five six. So you were probably pretty close to one to one. And apparently the Nikon reads the actual aperture instead of yes. Yes, Fantastic. that's what it is. Thank you so yeah. very much, yeah. Lloyd. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I just know there's a disconnect there. I know there's a reason for it, but I can't tell you in technical terms. <laughs> well, in my previous life, I did a lot of macro and micro. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, photomicrography, uh, out retired metallurgist. So, oh, wow. Uh, nice. Um, you know, and um, so I had to get into all that with that. But your work's great. It's beautiful. Thank you I so love, very much. I love the uh, shallow depth of field. I'm, I'm going to throw my helicon focus away now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, it's not for everybody. There's quite a few people who, when they shoot macro, they want everything. And so they'll, they'll stack their images. But for me, I really like the more light and airy and really bringing out particular details in a scene versus having every detail seen. Well, I think that helps me because I'm kind of still what they consider learning and new. So when I hear stacking and, you know, focus stacking and they took a picture of this pedal and then they moved it to the next pedal and then, you know, they combine like 200 images. And I mean, I'm yeah. like, Oh my gosh, I don't even want to even go there. So, um, too much work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it gives me hope. <laughs> so um, I'm excited to get out and try it maybe tomorrow. We're supposed to get some rings. So maybe I can find something to shoot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I'm excited. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, I really enjoyed your presentation. And like I said, we look forward to you coming back at a later time to talk about some of your other um, genres that you cover. Okay. Absolutely. And just to let you all know, if you do, if you get out shooting and you're like, I didn't quite understand that, or I can't really remember that, or if you have a question, please feel free to reach out to me, um, you know, through my website, avendorphotography.com. You can just drop me a message and I'll get back to you just as soon as I can and try and answer your questions. So, um, you know, I'm basically, I put it out there that once my student, always my student. So um, please reach out if you have any questions want to chat about photography, whatever it is, um, go ahead and just drop me a line. That sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good seeing all y'all. Y'all have a good night. Good night.